So why are the oceans important? We live in London, well, you live in London, some of you. We're a long way from the ocean in many ways, so is the ocean that important? Do we really care about the ocean? We know very little about our ocean. We learn about our ocean, new things about our ocean every single day. Um, and the re recent marine sensors of life that was um, released a few weeks ago, uh, there were over 2,000 new species of plants and animals discovered. And we know more about the surface of Venus and the moon than we do about our own sea floor. More people have walked on the moon than have been to the deepest part of our ocean. It's easier to walk on the moon than go to the deepest part of our ocean. So our inner space is still very much our unknown world. And there are many things we discover about our oceans, sometimes exciting things, new things, very positive things, sometimes slightly negative things as well. They're also a moderator of the world's climate. The oceans provide us with about 60% of the oxygen we breathe. They are the base of the food chain. And we often get students who come to us and say, I want to become an oceanographer because I want to save the whales and the dolphins. And, you know, these are the most important species on our planet. Actually, the most important species on our planet are the microscopic phytoplankton and zooplankton that are everywhere. They're prolific across the oceans. And they are probably the biggest absorber of CO2, carbon dioxide, on the planet as well. And the other thing to remember is the oceans actually cover over 70% of the planet. We aren't actually an Earth planet. We are an ocean planet. And if ocean officers had their way, we'd change the name of our planet by deed poll. Unfortunately, there aren't enough of us, so we're stuck with Earth for now. But one day, especially with sea level rises, we will be planet ocean. So as I said, the oceans are a fundamental part of our planet, our life. So understanding the oceans and being able to control the ocean is very important. Now, as David mentioned, I was involved to a certain extent on uh, the science behind some of the BP spill. We get involved with lots of disasters and horrible things, I'm afraid, uh, ranging from tsunamis to all kinds of accidents at sea. And in many ways, some of the early work we did with plastics was a very positive and joyous story. And it was based on, uh, as a chap called Curtis Ebsmeyer, an oceanographer in the States. And Kurt um, spent a lot of time investigating the fate of 40,000 plastic toys that spilled into the Pacific back in the early 90s, 1990s. And he was interested in these things because they acted as a sort of tracer. And lots of things end up in the ocean, and we use them as tracers, ranging from plastic bath toys to, uh, I think once upon a time, a, a container load of Nike trainers went over the side. And uh, on a slightly more very bizarre note, we do occasionally get stories coming from Vancouver Island about left feet in trailers turning up. We've never quite worked that one out, but anyway. Um, so as I said, these things act as traces, and they tell us a bit about the ocean currents. And so in the UK, we got involved with this um, at an early stage in trying to track these ducks down because although they started off in the Pacific, they did eventually work their way around to the Atlantic. And it shows how in a very short period of time, the ocean currents can distribute materials, whether it's plastic ducks or certain types of pollution around the world very, very quickly. Now, Kurt looked very much at this whole idea of the Pacific garbage patch, which has become a bit of a sort of a universal understanding. And with the Pacific garbage patch, we have these big gyres, these circulatory systems in the Pacific, which effectively focus, they trap in these whirlpools, the plastic material that gets thrown into our ocean. In its early stages, the plastic is buoyant, it stays at the surface, and it gets focused in these gyres. And these gyres, the circulation of these gyres, takes about six years in total to go one circuit round. And so we can see how material gets thrown into the Pacific and the coastlines from ships and so on gets focused in these areas. However, the sort of popular press view sometimes of the Pacific garbage patch is something like this. And there are plenty of pictures around of people going through, in inverted commas, the Pacific garbage patch. And I will hasten to add, it doesn't look like this. Um, that's probably a good thing in some ways. If we had something the size of Texas uh, looking like this, that would be really quite horrifying. But in many ways, what we have is a bit more sinister. What we have tends to be a lot smaller. The plastic breaks down to much smaller volumes. And the other thing is that we talk about the Pacific garbage patch, this big gyre, this big circulatory system here. But actually, the oceans have got several big 
garbage patches. There are similar gyres in the Atlantic, North and South, the South Pacific, and the Indian Ocean. And all of these circulatory systems, all of these gyres, focus surface materials into them. And there was some interesting work carried out um, between about 1986 and uh, last year by Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, uh, by colleague Cara um, Lavender Lee and her team. And they were looking over a long period of time at plastic in trawl nets. They did a series of trawl nets, particularly around the Florida coast. And the sorts of plastics we see aren't these sort of big chunks of plastic in the ocean, but it's these small particles, these very small bits and pieces, these small chunks of plastic. And the nets themselves don't catch the very fine microscopic plastic. As the plastic breaks down, it may look like a, a toy shot soldier to begin with, but with time it breaks down to smaller and smaller particles. And even those eventually fall through the very fine mesh nets. And what Cara noticed and what the team noticed was that if we looked at plastic pieces per square kilometer, not in the Pacific Gyre, but in the Atlantic Gyre, these are sorts of images we get. And this is going from 200,000 plastic pieces per square kilometer down to zero. And you can see there are patches where there's very high concentration of plastic particles in the water. This is surface, and if you translate those data sets into a sort of a nice, neat, um, pretty picture, this is what it looks like. As you can see, in the middle of this big Atlantic gyre, this is what we call the Sargasso Sea, we can see this concentration of plastic pieces. Now, what was interesting was that the team noticed that there was no significant increase in plastic particles between 1986 and uh, 2008. And this paper was published in Nature uh, fairly recently, and I had a chance to comment on it. And I think there are a number of reasons why this is the case. I think to a certain extent, we perhaps have been better in society at recycling our plastics and dealing with our plastics. And I think we're learning that plastics are a problem, and we'll see why in a minute. But I think also there's an assumption that these gyres trap the plastics. If you like, we have these nice, neat piles of plastics in our ocean, but they're only concentrated in these particular areas. And bear in mind, of course, that what this study doesn't pick up are the microscopic particles. And recent research has shown that in some parts of our oceans, these microscopic uh, flecks of plastic outnumber the phytoplankton, the zooplankton of the oceans. So there's more flecks of plastic in parts of our sea than there, are actual plastic, uh, than there are actual live phytoplankton or zooplankton. And that's quite a worrying thought. Um, why do I think that they're not seeing an increase? Well, actually, that earlier picture was a very simplified view of what the ocean currents look like. This is a step up. This is a slightly more complex view. But even this is very simplified, and this is just looking at the surface. So although the gyres do trap material, there's our Pacific gyre, there's our Atlantic gyre, Although the gyres trap this material, the material still escapes. And in fact, on the Pacific gyre, it's reckoned there's something like a 40% stick rate, i.e. after a six-year cycle, uh, only about 40% of the material in that gyre stays there. And the rest of it is escaping, in the same way as our plastic ducts from our story escaped from the gyre and actually made their way up through the Bering Straits and into the Arctic Ocean. Uh, some actually made their way down into the southern Pacific across the equator. So the plastic does escape. And we've been working quite a lot right up here in Spitsbergen or Svalbard, which is at about 80 degrees north. And originally, when we started working up there, I was quite keen to see if a report that had come out of uh, our own university, University of Southampton and University of Plymouth, a joint report which looked at plastic levels around UK coastal waters, and they showed that the microscopic dust in UK coastal waters was ubiquitous. All of our UK coastal waters have a certain concentration of plastic dust in them already. And I was actually intending to try and look at this plastic dust, thinking I wouldn't find much else. But actually, when we got to a place called Muffin Island, Muffin Island is probably one of the most remote islands on the planet. It's miles, hundreds, thousands of miles from anywhere significant. The nearest town is the huge town of Longyearbyen with a population of 3,000 people. And that's about 500 miles away. This collection of plastic was collected from a three square meter 
area, three by three meter area of Muffin Island Beach. Even the box itself that the plastic sits in was from Muffin Island Beach. And you could track the plastic back not only to Norway, but you could track plastic back to Britain, to Holland, to Canada, to America, to France, to Spain, and so on. So the problem doesn't know boundaries. There is no point in tackling the problem in one country because the ocean doesn't know about political boundaries. It's very ignorant like that. And basically, it ignores those boundaries and transports the material over large areas. So the problem's a real problem, and it's covering the entire planet. So what? Well, this is Muffin Island, and you can see here um, some walruses swimming in the sea, and walrus, one walrus has a plastic bag wrapped around its tusk. That plastic bag actually originated from the United States. That's not blaming the United States specifically, but it's just giving you an idea of how far plastic can travel. Here, we see a turtle with plastic in its mouth. To a turtle, a plastic bag looks just like a jellyfish. Turtles love jellyfish. Jellyfish keeps the turtle going. Uh, turtles suffocate and die when they eat plastic bags. And large numbers of turtles are being killed as a result of digesting plastic bags. And these are just two examples. There are many examples. Dave has already shown examples of birds. Um, if you go on the website, you'll find hundreds and hundreds of examples of things found in everything from mussels right through to blue whales. And so the plastic is in our system. Okay, we come back to the so what. Okay, on a large scale, big pieces of plastic can kill. But surely once it gets down to the very microscopic stage, is it just like roughage? Does it just go through the system and cause no problems at all? Well, a recent Japanese, and there's a bit of science for you, there won't be any questions afterwards, so don't panic. Um, a very recent Japanese study looked at what happens to plastic, to very microscopic particles of plastic, um, when they get to above 30 degrees C. And they find that certain types of polystyrenes and things break down and produce things like, this is just one example, I think called by phenol A, which is soluble at about 30 degrees C, which means that in the tropics, if there's plastic in the tropics, the plastic will break down to this sort of chemical. And that comes from things like the lining we get on tin cans. I come back to David's bottle. I don't know if it's plastic lined or not. Um, but most <laughs> aluminium cans have a, a lining like this to protect us from the aluminium inside. It comes from hard plastics. And apologies for that. There are names on those. That's not going at any particular company. But all the plastics we use contain these sorts of chemicals and they break down in the ocean to produce these um, chemicals. Now, there are several problems here. The first problem is that this then becomes a soluble problem rather than just particles. And as a soluble material, it is then well and truly not in the surface layers of the oceans, but in the entire ocean. The other problem is it does then start to have a dramatic effect on life in the oceans and ultimately on us. These chemicals act as endocrine disruptors, and some of them also, some of the plastics will also absorb like sponges. Some of the things like PCBs, uh, DDT, um, and some of the plastics will actually simulate things like estrogen. And this leads to all kinds of things like hermaphrodite shellfish, um, which means they eventually die. We've already seen that the currents of the ocean distribute our plastic on the surface worldwide. We also now, this is looking at the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt, the deep ocean convection and the deep ocean circulation is like a motorway running through the entire ocean system. Now this motorway takes a couple of hundred years to work its way around, but that means to say that all this dissolved material that's going into our ocean system is now working its way around the deep ocean. And the deep ocean is enormous. If you think about it, most of the plastic we produced so far is still in existence. I see lots of different values for the non-biodegradable starch-based plastics about how long they last, and I've no doubt it will give us a better idea of how long that is. But values range from 15 years to 1,000 years, and on that basis, most of the plastic we produce so far is out there still, and it's still in the ocean system, and it's working its way into the deep ocean. That means we have a big problem ahead of us because 
we can't clean this stuff up. It's not a question of going out there and trawling it up and taking it out of the ocean. We are stuck with it. And we need to start thinking about how that's going to impact our environment over the forthcoming years. And at that point, I will hand over back to David. Thank you. Thank you very much.